Thank you, Heinz Peter, for this very nice and kind introduction. Uh, those of you who have been in the morning session on liver imaging, you've heard a lot about very unusual and rare tumors. So basically, <laughs> liver metastases are the bread and butter lesions, but actually quite a common problem for us in, in radiology. And these are my disclosures. Actually, what are the learning objectives and what I would like to present in the next 25 minutes or so is how to perform CT and MRI, role of contrast with MRI, role of diffusion-weighted imaging, and then I will also try to give you an overview of what the literature says regarding the performance of various imaging modalities, ultrasound, CT, MRI, PET, CT, what should we actually use. And then in the end, I would like to give you some information regarding how to measure liver metastases according to RESIST. So if you're doing clinical trials and, and your oncologist want you to do this, even in clinical practice, and how to deal with disappearing metastases. Well, multi-detector CT clearly is the main imaging technique. That's the main pillar we use in oncologic imaging. And the question arises, how many phases do we need? And actually, for liver metastases, Unenhanced uh, phase imaging is uh, not necessary anymore and has been abandoned by most sites. But then it comes to the question, do we need arterial phase and venous phase? Do we need just, just venous phase? And I'll give you some, some examples on, on how to deal with this issue. We need, of course, contrast. And studies have shown that it's uh, probably good to use 0.5 to 0.6 grams of iodine per kilogram body weight uh, if you use a normal 120 kV protocol. So this relates, if you use a concentration of 300 milligrams per milliliter, that would be 1.7 to 2 milliliters per kilogram. But of course, if you use the higher concentration, it would be less milliliters. Flow rate should be high, 4 to 5 milliliters, in order to give you also good arterial phase imaging. And the slice thickness now, it has been shown that 2.5 or 3 millimeters is better than 5 millimeters, and certainly you should not have thicker slices than 5 millimeters, and they should be overlapping. So we use 3 millimeter slices with 1 millimeter overlap, for example. Metastases can be hypo or can be hypervascular, but as you know, most of the metastases we see are hypovascular especially metastases from adenocarcinoma, squamous cell cancer. You see here in the arterial phase, you don't see much, see it's just a slight inhomogeneity maybe here. But, you know, with venous phase imaging, you see that there are several bilobar metastases in this patient from colorectal cancer metastasis, uh, colorectal cancer, typical venous phase hypodense lesions. So... But sometimes we can have hypervascular metastases, especially neuroendocrine cancer, the formerly called islet cell tumors, renal cell cancer, sarcomas, melanoma, sometimes breast cancer. This is a patient with a malignant neuroendocrine tumor, glucagonoma. You see uh, these metastases better in the arterial phase than in the venous phase. But uh, beware, there is one metastasis which was only seen in the venous phase. So it's arterial phase imaging is clearly not enough and you also need this for characterizing uh, the venous phase. And rarely adenocarcinoma metastases can be hypervascular. So if you see in hypervascular <coughs> metastases, don't say this couldn't be an adenocarcinoma. This is such a case, big metastasis here in the left lobe, which is hypervascular and uh, shows washout in the venous phase. And this was uh, a patient with an adenocarcinoma of the sigmoid colon. How many phases do we actually need? Look at this case here. This is a venous phase scan in the patient with uh, pancreatic cancer. And if you just had a venous phase scan, you would say, well, there are several uh, lesions there. Can I differentiate whether they are cysts or metastases? And if you look at the unenhanced phase, uh, at that time we still did unenhanced uh, scans, or in, uh, with an arterial phase, you would have the same information. You clearly see that this is a very sharply demarginated uh, lesion, well circumscribed. So this is a cyst where all the other lesions are solid lesions. And if you just had a venous phase scan, you could not make the differentiation. So a baseline CT scan, CT scan should always be biphasic in the arterial and the venous phases. And then you can certainly say, 
I know that this patient has a colorectal cancer and do just a follow-up study of this hypovascular metastasis and then do just a single venous phase scan for radiation purposes. Sometimes it can be quite difficult to differentiate whether these small lesions, we've heard these too small to characterize lesions, are the cysts or are the metastases. Look at this patient here. You see this uh, small lesion in the left lobe in the venous phase. And of course, small cysts are better seen than solid lesions in the venous phase, but you're much more certain if you have an arterial phase and you still see in the arterial phase, this is very well marginated so this is most likely a cyst whereas metastases would be fuzzy or indistinct if you're still not sure you can do an mri see on the haste image so really this is for problem solving then you're pretty sure that this must be a cyst and it clearly could not be a metastasis things can go wrong if you just say well every small lesion i see is just a cyst look at this patient here with a colorectal cancer follow-up being performed at an outside institution that did just a single venous phase scan said well in 2014 this is a small cyst there subcapsule position nothing else uh, and then next year they say, still see uh, it's not that nice to see but it's the same cyst here and then they said well there is a new cyst in segment seven i mean new cysts can occur and sometimes cysts can even shrink upon chemotherapy, but you should be very suspicious that a newly appearing cyst, and moreover, this cyst is not really well marginated like this here. It's kind of fuzzy, indistinct, and unfortunately, the next follow-up was not performed six or 12 months later. It, it took another one and a half years, and then you see in 2017, <coughs> this cyst grew into a very, very big metastasis, and actually did cost uh, the patient his right liver lobe, but it still could be resected. So if you're in doubt, then always refer patients for MRI. How should MRI be performed? Then we have heard a lot of protocols, and I think it's, it's quite uniform or, or quite a consensus what to do. T1 gradient echo, preferably Dixon in phase, opposed phase, fat set, T2 Turbo spin echo with fat set, then we also add a T2 coronal without fat set. Either you can do it breath hold or free breathing, we we'll always do diffusion, and then conscious enhanced non specific gadolinium <coughs> or liver specific agents. There is still a lot of discussion going on what to uh, use in terms of information, also in terms of price, actually, I have to say. Well, as you're all aware, diffusion weighted imaging really is now standard for liver lesion detection. It's really very, very helpful. And as you see here, the water protons, they diffuse quite freely in the liver tissue. And if you have a cellular tumor, there is impaired diffusion in these tumors, which means that you have a higher signal uh, on your DWI image. Does it help for detection? It does help. Look at this image here, patient with colorectal cancer. The two right images are patients where are images with primovist, and you see clearly there is a metastasis here, and even you see this small metastasis in the caudate lobe, and you see this metastasis here. You see all three metastases also with diffusion, and but there is another small metastasis. And since this is a black blood technique and all the vessels are black, you see this nice metastasis, this small metastasis very nicely adjacent to the right uh, liver vein. And we could even, not even in retrospect, detect this metastasis on the hepatobiliary phase imaging. So uh, DWI helps for detecting small metastases. Does it help for characterizing? Not so much, I would say. Sometimes it helps for characterizing hemangiomas, but look at this case here, patient with three colorectal cancer metastases. This is a metastasis on DWI, another small lesion here. It's almost as bright as, as this uh, lesion there. Uh, is it also a metastasis? You're much 
pretty more confident if you look at the T2s. You see this metastasis here, moderately bright. The hemangioma here is much brighter. And if you look at the contrast enhancement, you see a rim enhancement of the metastasis. And this is a flash-filling hemangioma, which also had pooling of contrast in the venous phase. So there is some overlap in ADC values between B9 and, and malignant lesions. So DWI, in my opinion, cannot replace. It's, it's another kind of piece in the mosaic which you can use for characterizing lesions, but it can't re not replace actually contrast for characterizing lesions. We've heard a lot about liver-specific contrast agents, and clearly gadolinium acid and, and gadolinium bopta are very helpful. With gadolinium acid, you can, like with bopta, you can inject it V as a bolus and then do dynamic imaging. So look at the perfusion phase and the extracellular properties, and then followed by hepatocellular uptake. And this uptake into tumors depends on whether they have still this transporter protein. And metastasis clearly does not have this hepatocellular transporter protein. So you look at this patient here, very indistinct fuzzy lesions on the uh, T1 pre-contrast. There's something there, but it's much more obvious that these two metastases, and there's another small metastasis only seen after hepatobiliary contrast. So really, that helps, and I'll then discuss when to use actually hepatobiliary. And the most likely, or I think that the strongest indication is for metastases which are deemed resectable, where you really want to know what the exact number of metastases is. Or another patient where we saw a single metastasis well, on the unenhanced scans, here T1 dark, T2 moderately bright. After injection of gadoxetic acid, you see this rim enhancement and this uh, dark metastasis in the hepatobiliary phase. And there is another metastasis down there in the right lobe we could not even in retrospect find on any other pulse sequence. So, uh, and uh, how about the combination? diffusion and uh, liver-specific agents. Look at this patient here. With CT, you see some cysts. You see here, uh, there is a kind of an indistinct, obviously solid lesion. And you know, giving uh, EOB, you have this nice rim enhancement, the dynamic phase. You see this lesion there. And also, you see more lesions with diffusion. So basically, it's the combination of diffusion plus liver-specific agents, which gives you more information than CT for detection characterizing lesions. And this has actually been nicely shown in a very recent meta-analysis of Valérie Villegrain. And she looked at uh, all the studies dealing with diffusion and uh, gadoxetic acid. And this meta-analysis is a very recent data, uh, including studies up to 2015. And the 39 articles, 2,000 patients, 3,800 uh, 3, metastases. And they found that the combination of gadoxetic acid plus diffusion had the highest sensitivity of 95% in total. And for metastases, one centimeter and smaller, still 83, 84%. Uh, and what they found was the combination was better than gadoxetic alone, and gadoxetic was better than. Uh, diffusion-weighted imaging. So the combination of gadoxetic acid enhanced MRI and diffusion MRI should be used in patients with liver metastases which are deemed resectable. I think <clears throat> personal view is doesn't make really much sense to use a liver-specific agent if you have a patient with uh, a multitude of uh, metastases, for example, breast cancer patient, renal cell cancer patient, you just have to do a follow-up and it really doesn't make much of a difference if there are 10 or 12 lesions, but for a colorectal cancer patient who's going to undergo liver surgery, it really makes a difference if this patient has one, two, or five metastases. And then, what are actually, what is the evidence, what imaging technique should we really use? And I came across two meta-analyses which have been published a couple of years ago and really, I think these two meta-analyses highlight the problem uh, you face when the studies which are analyzed in the meta-analysis are, I would say, at best suboptimal. So in this meta-analysis in 2010, they analyzed CT, MRI, PET, and PET-CT. 
And was they, what they found in this, uh, looked at the sensitivity per lesion and the sensitivity per patient. The sensitivity per lesion was with CT 74%. With MRI, it was 80%, which is quite reasonable that MRI is slightly better than CT, but PET, not PET-CT, PET had the highest sensitivity of 81%, and then they included just a few PET-CT papers, and actually the, the sensitivity of PET-CT in the meta-analysis was substantially lower than, than just PET alone. But obviously, at, totally at odds with the results they present was their conclusion. MR imaging is the preferred first-line modality, and FDG-PET can be used as a second-line modality. Nobody would use PET as a second-line modality if you're not, not confident with MRI. Or look at another <coughs> meta-analysis, for, actually from the same year. They looked at ultrasound, <coughs> CT, MRI, and PET. And actually, they came up that obviously all the modalities had the same sensitivity per lesion. But look at the heterogeneity. If you look at the sensitivity per patient, the studies included ultrasound sensitivity 25 to 87%. And all the other studies, they had also a very wide range. CT sensitivity 48%, which is not very, I would say, optimistic, but 100%. And MRI 100%. And PET, again PET, not PET CT, 100% sensitivity. So their conclusion was the more thorough evidence suggests that MRI is the modality for the detection of colorectal cancer metastasis. Actually, you, I could not derive that conclusion from, from the data here. So basically, I would say garbage in, garbage out. Just if you look at the more recent studies which have really compared two modalities, if you look at CT versus MRI, and some studies from the recent years most of them, or actually all of them, showed that galaxetic MRI is superior to CT. Yes, 79 versus 97%. Well, I think it's slightly optimistic. But they are more important, there is a really clinical significant difference when it comes to small metastases. Metastases, one centimeter small in the study of BAMU, 26% with CT, 92 with MRI. Or in the study we did, uh, a patient with fatty liver, fatty liver small mets, 11% with CT, still 66% with MRI. So I think MRI clearly superior to CT for colorectal liver metastases. And this especially holds true for small metastases and for metastases in fatty liver. And some other studies comparing MRI and PET-CT. And again, here you see that MRI is better than PET-CT in the direct head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, but, you know, maybe PET-CT will gain a kind of a stronger role in the future. Instead of doing a chest abdomen CT, maybe do, we'll do in five years' time chest abdomen or PET-CT, contrast-enhanced uh, PET-CT, uh, to get more information. But the data are not out there uh, to imply that this would be superior to doing just a normal chest abdomen CT for staging of these patients. Is MRI the magic bullet? Yeah. Uh, well, there are still some, some pitfalls with MRI and some caveats. Some people have trouble holding their breath for 20 seconds uh, with gadoxetic acid. Uh, here you see such a ghost artifact patient uh, who couldn't hold his breath. With gadoxetic acid, sometimes we see these trends in dyspnea after administration. So the arterial phase gets blurred. And if you have a kind of a poor diffusion weighted imaging, see this was not a, a good 1.5 Tesla machine with quite weak gradients, then you can have trouble uh, using really diffusion weighted imaging. So I think more consistent image quality is acquired with CT in patients with a poor general health status. So, so the, the, the sicker the patients are, the better CTs. Or another problem with uh, with uh, gadoxetic acid, or actually it's, it's uh, a pitfall, and you should just know this, uh, that uh, there is kind of a paradoxical uptake of gadoxetic acid in liver metastases, though you may see this target appearance, especially in patients with breast cancer metastases, which can mimic an uptake in hepatocellular lesion. You just have to know this is the unenhanced T1, this is the arterial phase, and in the hepatobiliary phase you see, still see continued uptake don't mistake this as a hepatocellular uptake. It's just kind of <coughs> persistent extracellular 
uh, enhancement of the very densely fibrotic part of this metastasis here. You can also see this with cholangiocarcinoma sometimes. So you just have to know this. Well, shall we do now MRI or CT when it comes to patients with liver metastasis? And a very nice study, actually, a couple of years ago, a randomized trial looked at uh, MRI with liver-specific agent versus MRI with non-specific contrast versus CT. A randomized trial with more than 300 patients. How many patients actually needed a second imaging modality? And if it did started with a gatopsetic acid MRI, actually none of these patients needed a second modality to clarify what's going on in the liver. If you did a non-specific gadolinium MRI, 17%, and if you did a CT, 39% of patients needed a second modality. So the diagnostic confidence was higher with liver-specific MRI than non-specific gado than CT. The problem is only most surgeons would not perform study or a surgery of colorectal liver metastases without having a chest abdomen CT because you want to know what's the total load of tumor in a particular patient is. Like in this patient here, you see the met metastasis with CT. You see more metastasis clearly in the combination with liver-specific MRI and diffusion, but CT shows another metastasis here in the lung, which actually completely changes the strategy in such a patient. Uh, but clearly, MRI has a value because it has an additional value in patients with potentially resectable colorectal liver metastases. And if you look at CT here in that study, it had a sensitivity of 50% diffusion roughly 80% galoxetic MRI, more than 90%. And again, the combination uh, of uh, diffusion with galoxetic acid was uh, actually the best you could do. And moreover, this strategy using galoxetic acid with diffusion that changed the surgical therapy or surgical strategy in about one third of patients, either because you had to do an extended resection because you found more metastases than you anticipated from CT alone, or the patient could not undergo surgery because you found so many metastases that this patient was deemed unresectable. Uh, in the end, just a few words about uh, how to measure liver metastases uh, in the resist system. You've heard a lot about resist, five target lesions, maximum two per organ, and we shall always try to find the longest diameter of these target lesions, and according uh, to these measurements, then we uh, categorize patients as complete or partial response, stable disease, or progressive disease. And with CT, we should always measure with this hypovascular metastasis in the venous phase because you have the best consistency. And include that hypovascular rim you see here in the venous phase. So here in the venous phase, this three centimeter, this metastasis, if you look in the arterial phase, the same metastasis, including this very thick hypervascular rim would be more than four centimeters. So this is a more than 30% uh, uh, kind of uh, increment. So if you use different phases, then you can easily miscategorize a patient. If you had MRI, use T1, again, preferably with contrast. We did a study quite a couple of years ago where we measured the, the size in, of the metastasis versus the surgical specimen. And what we found, actually, the mean size difference of measurement uh, between the arterial and venous phase was roughly 15 to 20 percent. And actually, we found a quite a good or enormous size difference between this, what we measured in CT versus the real size of the surgical specimen. In the venous phase, it was uh, the least size difference. You see arterial phase 20 percent, unenhanced phase 28 percent. But as I said, uh, the more striking feature was that we had a 15 to 20 percent mean size difference between the measurements taken in the arterial phase or in the venous phase. So the key point is always measure in the same phase and use the same protocol uh, to get good and consistent measurements. One thing with the uh, resist I would like uh, to, to alert you to is that we have this category of complete response 
in radiology, but that does not necessarily mean that it's pathologically complete response. And uh, when you look at the old studies, I would say from about 10 years ago, when we saw a complete response in the liver, that meant actually that in at least 80%, these patients still had residual tumor or tumor recurrence. So either a reappearing metastasis, or if this area was cut out at surgery, there was still residual tumor found. More recent studies published just a few years ago found that the recurrence rate, if we see with MRI now a complete response, is only 16 to 20 percent. So obviously the drugs are getting better. But to show you some, some where it actually didn't work, 2015, you see two metastases here. Look at the small one there. You know, after chemotherapy, getting smaller, almost gone. This getting smaller, then the left liver lobe was cut out. And you know they couldn't cut out here because they didn't find anything. But after this discontinuation, you see that there's reappearance of this liver metastasis there. So complete response with radiology doesn't mean complete response upon histology. So what shall we actually do with these disappearing or potentially disappearing metastases? We sit in the MDT meeting saying, well, there are three or four metastases you, the surgeon will find after the neoadjuvant therapy, but there is one small metastasis in the parenchyma that the surgeon may not find after shrinking of that, uh, of that metastasis. So what can you do? Actually, you can do percutaneously insert a clip marker. You see this small metastasis, we're not sure whether the surgeon will find this ever again. So we uh, uh, basically using anatomic landmarks put a clip marker there to guide the surgeon then to still to find that metastasis after neoadjuvant therapy. Or what you could do if you still, it's completely invisible with MRI, you could uh, do kind of a liver specific MR uh, guided study and then do under MR guidance, insert a clip marker in these CT invisible metastases. So let me come to the conclusion. Well, MDT, MDCT, still is and will be in the near future the main pillar of detection and characterization of patients with uh, liver metastases. MRI is a great tool in equivocal CT, preferably with liver-specific MR contrast agents. Uh, MRI with liver-specific uh, contrast is really the method of choice in patients with colorectal liver metastases, which are deemed potentially resectable. MRI changes the therapy and the strategy in roughly one third of the patients. And you have to uh, develop together with the surgeons kind of oncologic strategy to deal with these potentially disappearing metastases. Thank you.